This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And if you could, please do me a favor and take a moment and leave a rating and review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Heart Radio. doesn't matter. I'd greatly appreciate it, and that feedback really helps get other listeners to the show. Also, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to agutor.com slash tip and donate to the show. Thanks so much. All right, Geek Leaders, today I'm honored to have Greg Davis on the show, um, and he is with Big Leaf Networks, and he's had a really interesting story. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about um, how he got to where he is today and uh, about the importance of trust when it comes to uh, management and leadership. Anyway, with all that being said, Greg, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, John. Good to see you. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about your background, how you got into technology uh, to begin with, and uh, what is it that you're doing now? Yeah, true thing. So uh, I got into technology because I was desperate. I think that is consistent with how most people end up uh, in in this industry, in particular on the sales side. Uh, I grew up in the service industry. My my grandfather, my father, um, you know, my brothers had all been in the restaurant industry. We, my family, was sort of pioneers, if you will, in the back in the fifties in the uh, early morning breakfast business. And so I literally cut my teeth and grew up. Uh, growing up in in full service restaurants, yeah. and in two, and um, and my brother and I had had some restaurants in South Louisiana back in the nineties, and I had an event that take place in that took place in one of the in one of the restaurants. It was a very unfortunate, um, you know, one of these employee shooter kind of scenarios where wow, I had an employee that came in the back door and 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 was trying to steal money from us, and it was a very tragic event, and a couple of people lost their lives, and it it had it was. It was coming right at the time that um, it hit me right as the time where I was having kids, and so I'll sort of keep the you know the the personal uh, uh, um, you know hit that goes along with something like that, and just for purposes of this podcast, focus mainly on the professional side. Um, but it was devastating to my business. First of all, I mean, you, you, you're going through. You're I was in a restaurant, and people go, tend to go to those places because they're safe and because they you know they like the scene and they like the people and so that part of my professional world was in was in was shattered again. Not to mention what I was going through on the personal side, where you've lost friends and you kind of deal with that. All and through through all of that, um, like two things happened. One is I was in trouble financially, and I had to figure out what are we going to do to drive business going forward to get ourselves out of the ditch because we have responsibilities for the employees that we have. And you know, learned a little bit about crisis management and. Anyway, I got into the catering business, and the remnants of that catering business uh, still do the skybox contract for LSU's Tiger Stadium in Louisiana. My brother and sister in law run that, run that business. Um, I got into that, and I got an appetite for sales. And so, I, a couple of things were happening. Number one, I wanted to get into a new industry. I was having children, and I had just been through this devastation. I wanted to find something else to do. I had sort of built this catering business and was beginning to plot. That was going to give me the ability to get out of the deal that I was in. Uh, and then what, as I was doing that, I, I was enjoying the concept of going out and finding customers and acquiring those customers. And so the kind of the sales part of it was very enjoyable. And I had always been an operator. So, um, you know, t- taking, I'm, I'm looking for something new. Uh, I want to get out of the industry that everyone I've known really has been in. And I need to make money. I have children that are, you know, I have, a, I have two, two children that are headed to, you know, Lord knows what, but I know it's going to be expensive. And so, <laughs> you know, I started thinking, where can I take my skill set, which a lot of people think in the service industry, your restaurant skill set isn't necessarily applicable to other things, which is, I think nothing could be further from the truth. Um, but I thought, you know, the, the, the mechanics of any service department, um, in other words, well, that I didn't come out right. The, the procedural discipline and support of any service environment, regardless of what it is, really involves tickets coming in, tickets coming out. How many do you have? How, they call them all days in the service industry. Yeah, and then, and then what's the process by which those tickets are moving? And kind of what's the mean time to closure? And then what is the what is the nature of those tickets? You know, a, a, a database ticket is different than a 
uh, a user, you know, a password change or a username ticket. Those two things aren't the same in the exact same way that an appetizer and a steak are, are, are different things. And so the concept of how restaurants work and the concepts of how kitchens work, I thought directly applied themselves to technology. And so, um, so I got into technology sales, building frame relay networks and uh, that kind of thing. I was working for a Cisco system reseller. And then as I sorted to, you know, got on sure footing, um, moved to Texas and, 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 and got you know, really serious about my sales career, I started looking for opportunities to really apply the operational skills that I had and, and, and learned from the, my 11 years in the restaurant industry. Uh, and I had cut myself off from my, um, from my family, so to speak, in terms of the family fortune, which wasn't much of a fortune, if you will. And so I needed access to capital. And I wanted to go, you know, d- d- get the best use to my skills. And that took me into two things. It took me into the world of private equity and, and, and raising capital to run businesses. And it took me into the managed hosting space. Uh, and that's really where I started my career. I got connected with a couple of folks, one of which is on the board of directors uh, here at Big Leaf today. His name's Dave Colasante. He founded a business and we built, you know, we assembled a team of people and started to expand that business and and we acquired a division of Sprint, really got that business moving. We sold it in 2007 to uh, a SunGuard, which is a, mm-hmm. yeah. a large technology company out of Philadelphia. And then in 2009, m- m- the founder of, 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 uh, of Vera Center was the name of that business. Our CEO, a gentleman by the name of Gray Hall and I, uh, uh, took over a business called uh, uh, Alert Logic. We went in to work with the founder, and then we scaled that business up. And we, we we got in in 2009. We scaled it uh, um, up in 2000 to, to 50 million, from like eight to 50 million in revenue, and sold that business in 2012 uh, to a new private equity group. And then we built that business up to 130 million, I think, it, at its peak. Uh, and then we sold that that business ended up selling, I think, in 2022. Um, I, in 2018, I got out of the, and Alert Logic was a was an IT security a, a business, mainly focused on securing workloads in AWS cloud environment. And then in, in um, I got out of that in, in 2018 and um, sort of did a little bit of a side project with a, with a private equity group called Cap Street, built a payments business called Hunger Rush that was focused on, uh, it really, it was kind of an interesting twist. I got in the online ordering business and uh, uh, the online ordering and cloud PMS business about a year before the pandemic, <laughs> which turned out to be a pretty good time to make that move. Yeah, no kidding. We were, pri- <laughs> we were primarily focused on uh, on on pizza. And then along while I was doing the Hunger Rush project, I was on the board of directors for um, a group uh, out of uh, a, a company out of Portland called Big Leaf Networks, where I'm the CEO today. And just kind of tying it together, which I think your your folks, your listeners will appreciate, the the private equity f- group, which is a lot of the source of capital for businesses, the private equity group that I work for is the same group that I went to work for early in my career at Alert Logic. So I, I went in my you know, my we came out of a out of a project, uh, you know, with a good a good working group of executives and managers. We stuck together. We got in another deal with. Um, with a PE firm, sold it. We went on to do other things, and now I'm currently back with that same group again, doing another deal with them. So, yeah, I think the message there is that, yeah, you know, it's a pretty small world, and and yeah, you know, people along your journey are going to certainly pop back up again, and that's that's been the case for me. So, yeah, if I had to summarize it just in terms of the track record, John is I, I, I um, I've operated out of you know again out of, out of kind of necessity. You know, I have mm-hmm. a, a, a you know a big appetite for. For, for things, I, I, you know, I, I, I like to spend money. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like nice things. I have kids, that kind of thing. And so I gravitated toward, you know, what was intellectually stimulating for me based on my experiences and where could I make the most money? And, you know, that led me into to technology and ultimately into software. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of us kind of end up going into technology. I mean, either that, either that or we have a love of, you know, creating things and playing around and seeing what we can do with technology from a young age. Um, I can go back to... Um, I love technology as a youngster. My neighbor actually worked at a company called NCR and he would always bring home like computer parts and me and him would build, you know, back then it was like 80, 86 computers and donate them to like charities and stuff. And he was also a youth pastor. So we kind of used that to kind of build things. And I got 
you know, my bug for technology back then. Then when I went to college, I was like, well, what, what pays well? You know, I got a business degree, uh, thinking that that was the route, but ended up coming back into tech. So, uh, interesting. NCR, that's a, that's who Ungarish competed with. They started Atlanta. That's a great, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So mine's a little different. Um, the, the, it, in terms of the people that a lot, a lot of times that I work with. So for instance, Joel, the founder of Big Leaf, uh, he got in this to solve a problem that he, you know, rural broadband in or, or uh, broadband wireless broadband access in rural Oregon was, a, you know, that was it was very difficult. And so mm -hmm. he he saw that as a problem. He was working for a fixed wireless provider, and he thought, how can I solve this problem? And he built the the bones of a big leaf, and ultimately went on to build that business. I don't have that. I tried that in the restaurant business, and I probably could build that entrepreneurial skill and commitment in, in a restaurant. In these businesses that I go in and run, which is essentially what I do, I come in behind a, a founder and help them scale their business and you know get 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 the business in position to take advantage of whatever is available to it and put it in the best position. Um but I, I'm doing it for the people. I'm I'm trying to build careers. I'm trying to build managers. I'm trying to take folks that are that don't have any idea how smart they are because they perhaps don't have academic training that are often the nuts and crannies of the business and begin to pull, which is what I was, and begin to pull those folks out and begin to develop the, the skills. And the indies, whether we're solving fixed wireless broadband problems, or in some cases, whether we're selling point of sale systems or payment systems or IT security or that kind of thing, that, that the technology piece of that is less interesting to me. The customer acquisition piece and the development of the resources inside the business is what kind of my GM is. And I have a couple of those right now. The guy that, the gentleman that runs engineering for us, you know, it's just to, you know, it was, he was down further in the organizational chain when I came into Big Leaf and he's been promoted and his, his name's David Kabarak. He'll go on to do great things. And, you know, I think people are full of it when they say they don't like having their fingerprints on someone's career. And I don't say that. I love that. I love knowing that I've helped somebody or you know, I was there for them as they were starting to develop. So I'm more in it than that. I, I wish at times I was more into the problem that we solve. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just not, yeah, this is not, not, that's not what I'm in it for. Uh, yeah. You know, then as we get older, the money's less interesting than it was when we were younger. You know, I think, you know, when I, I, I think I told you it was, I was desperate and, and, and I think early on that is the case. And now you can be a little bit more choosy about the deals that you engage with and you get a little bit more out of them. Yeah, and I think uh, you know affecting people uh, for me it was like uh, it was I, you know I like to equate it to beer. It's like an acquired taste. You know, the first time you know you're in college and you have that first beer, it's like ugh, you know. And now you're like, oh, I need to have you know. It's nice to have a, a beer and watch the game. And I think uh, building people kind of is that similar um, aspect for me. When I first became a manager, I hated the people side of it. I just wanted to solve the problems. But the more I learned about you know, what people call soft skills, which I call them hard skills, because that's really the hardest part, in my opinion, is, is to, to develop people and to see the success that comes whenever you spend time with someone and then they get it and then their career takes off. Uh, I think that is so much more rewarding than solving the problem now. Totally. Couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, and having that, that, that structure in place that helps you do that. What are some of the tools and maybe, you know, things that you've learned um, over the years that help you develop people and, and, you know, build that relationship that's important to, to grow those individuals. Cause you know, like I said, for me, it was a difficult thing because I was so focused on solving the problem and it took me getting a mentor that just one day told me that I suck as a manager and that, you know, I, I, I don't scale is the exact word for you don't scale. You need to get out of your team's way and help them grow. Cause you being in the middle of it, just it, it's a bottleneck and you've got to get out of there. Um, you know, so I learned stick, taking a step back and allowing people to to learn and grow was was really important. Yeah, no doubt. And I, so, you know, look, I, I've been on both sides of the bottlenecks. I've been mm -hmm. used to being part of the bottleneck, and I certainly spent a lot of time making sure that you you bust them up. I think the key there is that everyone needs to be looking for choke points inside the business, you know, and then eradicate those, you know, when you can. I, for me, and and how it. Yeah, when it comes to developing folks, it's, yeah, I think about management in this concept. Your job as a manager is to get your people to the goals that you've set for that, that have been set for them, either by you or by whoever else. Now, the responsibility of making sure that those goals are sound and attainable, you know, we have to trust, big word, 
we have to trust that that happens upstream and you should demand that. But assuming that that's the case and that that you know, fabric is properly woven, if you will, and people are handed goals that they're expected to, to, to hit. And I think in a lot of cases, managers believe that it's my responsibility to control the style with which someone gets extinguishes the goals that are in front of them. Or, you know, it's my job to make them better in this area or that area. And that can be true. But the first goal is, is of a manager is to get people to their goals, you know, of course, through moral and ethical fairways, but getting to them to the goals is where it's at. And so I spend a lot of time with developing managers and developing uh, uh, managers of managers toward, you have to put your people in position to win. If people don't believe that they can win, then they're not going to, you're not going to get the performance that you need out. And generally speaking, the businesses that I'm in require sort of one and a quarter step, if you will, out of every human that's in the business because we're either bootstrapping or we're operating on borrowed money. So we need high performance. And so what do people, how do people perform well? Well, they tend to perform better if they think they can win. Yeah. And, and it's sort of like taxes and the Laffer curve, if you will. You know, you tax them 100%, people don't work very hard. But as long as they think they can win, then you have, then, then, then people tend to be motivated. And kind of, you know, the next thing is that people need to be safe. And I have some, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the call, you know, I have some big safety things that we could talk about, but there's subtle safety things as well. So people operate, I know what it takes to win and I'm safe. You know, the pads that I have on my body to play this sport are going to protect me from bad things. Or the institution that I'm in is going to provide me with the safety. I don't have to worry about things. I can perform. So I know how to win. I'm in sort of the, I'm on sure footing relative to, to doing what I need to do because, you know, because I'm safe. And then it's communication and reporting. And so you, you know, you have to, you, if people save, you know, I tell folks, when you leave a meeting, pick it apart. What could we have done better? What, it, whether the meeting is good, whether the meeting is, it went poorly, have the same structure for how you take, you pick apart meetings and continually improve. That way it's not as dramatic when somebody says something like me, says something stupid or does something that's out of band. And so that concept of communication is really important. Same thing with reporting. So you, you know, you, you transparency, you know, with sunlight cures, transparency, you, know, you don't, you don't want surprises. And so people think that, um, that, that you know, people seeing how things are performing relative to those goals on a regular basis eliminates surprises. And so let's go back to number two, the safety topic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot to expand. So the first thing, the first, the the first check of the box is, you know, am I physically safe? You know, am I physically safe? You know, am I going to get hurt? Is is this a, is this, you know, if you could check that box, you know, everything's okay. Am I, you know, do I have to run the risk of, you know, somebody, you know, doing something improper, that kind of thing? No, I'm safe. This is a good, well, well well-run thing. So I'm physically safe. I can express my ideas and say, hey, I think this I'm, this isn't going to work. These goals are not attainable, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't agree with you. Uh, this seems weird. It's too expensive. The market's not going to buy this. That's the ability to speak your mind is intellectual safety. And that can be equally, th- that can be as much of a problem as physical safety. In other words, if I think of what we're doing, you know, think of the emperor's new clothes. So yeah, I think, I think of, of, of what we're doing is going to be really, really dumb, but I'm not saying anything about it because I just, you know, no, no one else is. And so I, I'm going to kind of, well, that person's not going to perform as well. They don't believe in what we're doing. And so that concept of intellectual safety, I can speak my mind um, um, at, and without, without, without ret- retribution, financial safety. I'm the, the I'm, it on, you know, poster child for that. I'm in a business where I know that management is making sound decisions and this business is going to be here. And so I'm very open with liquidity, if you will. I'm very open with the financial performance of a privately held company that's really no one's business how we do. But, you know, when I'm with my employees, I, they understand exactly where we are. They know that, you know, I always keep, no matter how much business, you know, cash the business is burning, I always have two cycles of payroll. And a lot of people just don't get into that detail with people. I do financial safety. And then professional safety. So there are times, and I've had to do this multiple times in my career, I've had to reduce the size of a business. 
mm-hmm. and shrink it down. And then, and, and, and then obviously, you know, over the years I've had you know, probably thousands of employees and, and, and at times you need to, to, to terminate employees. People just, they're not, they're, they don't fit in this band, so to speak. And so two different scenarios. One is there, I need to reduce the force and you're limited in what you can do there. So you try not to surprise anyone again, professional safety. So everyone knows on the way in that in the event of this is how we're going to respond to it. And if that ever happens, here's how it's going to respond. So you don't need to worry. If we ever have to reduce the size of this business, you're going to know in advance that we're tied on cash. And then we're going to make an announcement and that kind of thing. And so you do everything you can to make sure that people don't worry about that. Um, or that they're, that they know when to worry about. it. And then when it comes to, to, to terminating people, uh, or, you know, or, or coming to the end of, 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 you know, of a working relationship with someone, it surprise, you know, you don't want to surprise someone. So again, that concept of uh, they understand what their goals are. I'm reinforcing that through reporting. I'm reinforcing that through good communication. And all of those things give me that kind of safety thing that I need. So I don't, you don't have to worry about losing your job and being surprised. You don't have to worry about us not having the financial discipline to make sure that we can invest in the goals that you need to go hit. You're, you're intellectually safe to speak your mind and you understand the framework in which you can do that. And you're physically safe. There's no one grabbing your ass. There's no one that's, that's doing things that you don't agree with. There's no, you know, the back doors are locked. This is a safe place to operate. And if you can get the team back to the original question, if you can have a team that's focused on, I trust, check all the safety boxes. I have trust. I know what I need to do. If anything that's going to happen that's outside of that and anything changes, I'm going to be communicated with. And every 7, 14, 28 days, I'm getting a report that tells me way in advance when I'm drifting off or or one of the leading indicators of my performance is changing. If you can do that, then you can get people to perform very well. And that can be against selling, again, sprinkler heads for, 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 for water systems or sophisticated router technology to make the internet work better. Um, in our, our kitchen in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, it's, it all kind of functions the same way. No, that makes perfect sense. And I love the way you kind of broke that down because we've had a lot of people talk about, you know, you have to have transparency, but what does that mean? And the fact that you kind of broke it down into like the reports, uh, you know, communicating even as far as financial success of your company and where things are at and how you would play out certain scenarios if they happen. I think that's very important. And, you know, having a framework that other leaders can kind of look at and say, okay, here's how we show transparency and here's how we build that safe environment. And I love the fact you kind of focus on that intellectual safety, because I think we've all worked for and hell I've even been a boss, you know, that sometimes doesn't provide that intellectual safety and tells people, you know, that your idea is dumb, which is not a good thing to do. You know, you need to listen and hear things out. And I've learned from that. And I think that's an important thing to kind of focus on that, People do need to have that intellectual safety to where they can openly criticize uh, an idea that the leader is saying and, and talk about why they think it's not a good idea or that is a good idea. And here's a better idea and things like that. So, so you're in the media business, right, John? Yeah. Okay. So you're familiar you're with, think of Saturday Night Live in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you familiar? Have you, ever, have you seen the episodes? Have you ever uh, seen like the, the Cone? I, I, I've seen many of them. Yes. I've seen the Cone Heads. Okay. So imagine, no, no. You know, think through, again, you're in this industry, so think through the production of the Coneheads. At some point in time, someone had to walk into a room and say, hey, I have this idea. And that takes a lot of courage. Mm-hmm. The output of that was the silly thing that ended up catching lightning in a bottle, if you will. And there's other examples of that. But I think entertainment is a very is a great example of, of that in action. It takes a lot of courage and it's very intimate to sing a song, to create that kind of content, to do that. That same thing happens in business. It's the same gene that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's less and people get to get a lot of slack because the fat, the fairway is so wide, if you will, but a chef producing a plate of food, um, it is, is a similar version of the same thing. But it's, it's, it's intellectual safety. I'm safe to put my things out there and weird and crazy and cone-headed as they may sound if i'm in the right group and i'm in the right structure we can catch lightning in a bottle and do amazing things with crazy ideas and your industry is probably the best place to train folks in line if you will 
No, yeah, absolutely. You can even, you know, come back to even more modern examples of that. I mean, look at look at Yellowstone. You know, huge success. And who would have thought a Western you know, show in twenty you know, the twenty twenties would, would be successful, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I like the idea also you talked about, uh, you know, you know, picking apart your meetings and, and looking back at it. It sounds like you're, you're talking about a retrospective for basically all meetings and having like a framework that you follow, whether it was a good meeting or bad meeting to, to make sure you hit those things. Um, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I just, so, so there's always, in, let's just think of it through the lens of customer acquisition. So okay. in customer acquisition, you have you, you, especially in anything that looks like enterprise customer acquisition, you tend to travel in packs. There's, mm-hmm. there's someone making some level of executive decisions. There's someone that's in ch- charge of the relationship. And then there's a technical resource and you may or may not have a product person as well. And those are resources that are, that are coming from a pool, depending on what the skill set is, right? So if it's a, if it's this product, then you might have this product manager. If it's that product, you might have that product manager. So so enterprise sales calls tend to involve a group of people that change frequently. So you you know so it's it's a it's a it's not always the same three or four people. So you're always you know it's 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 some different combination of say twenty, and so you're always working in different configurations of those people, and all and you're always developing one of the technical resources, or you're always developing one of the product resources to look for opportunities. For them to shine so that you don't end up with salespeople that are chit-chatting all the time. And so the best way to do that when you come out of a meeting, and, and so you go to these partner meetings and people are super enthusiastic about it. And everyone wants to go in those meetings and walk out feeling good about that. And and so you 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 execute the meeting and the meeting goes well and you have a next step and you accomplish your goals in your meeting. And you know, classic as you walk out and people go do whatever, they go celebrate the fact that they just had a good meeting. And people get on down the road. And so what, if, but you tend to miss things. So the meeting went well and we accomplished what we needed to accomplish because, you know, someone is very good, but that doesn't take away from the fact that the sales engineer missed these three opportunities to expand on this or the product team didn't capture this kind of thing. So if you just walk out of that meeting and you say, and you pick it apart and you say, and the salesperson should do this or whatever the relationship person is. Let's go around the horn and let's take the the fine print of each of the sections as part of the agenda of the meeting. And let's talk about how we could have made that better. And you can do that in a casual way, literally walking to your car, walking to the train, but you always cover it. Product, engineering, sales, the executive component of it. Um, and 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 it's what, what what did we do? What were we trying to do? Is there anything that we could do to have made that better is there anything that we shouldn't do again mm-hmm. and so you know, the out of that yield and i'll go back to my early vera center days vera center we had a single slide if you will an artifact it was a it was a diagram and that was our you know that was the thing that we that we really sold with and if you were in a sales call you were looking at that diagram and the way that that got created was through years, if you will, of people walking out of meetings and coming up with a new way to explain, a new way to adjust, a new way to improve on our messaging. And so that just stuck with me as continual improvement in a very productive way. And so I like to do that. You know, if you think of it, you and I finished this podcast and, you know, we're, and we just spend 60 seconds to a minute and a half talking about how each of us could improve. Greg, you, you talk too much. You move. <laughs> you, you never stop. <laughs> I think that's great, and you know, and, and, you know, and looking looking at that, that's actually how I improved on this show because I used to, you know, a lot of people start podcasts because they like to hear themselves talk. It's not quite frankly, and um, I would override the guests a whole lot and didn't realize that like I would talk over them because I would hear something interesting and I, it's like my ADHD couldn't hold back and I had to like jump in there. And then mm-hmm. um, I had someone that had this really good piece of advice that says when you have something to say instead of just saying it put a pencil right in front of your, your computer, right in front of your keyboard. And, you know, just mentally place your idea of what you're going to say on that pencil. And as soon as they finish talking, pick up that pencil and say your idea. And that was a way for me to kind of realize the engagement that I needed to slow down. So it happened very similar to what you said, but it was a little bit, probably a little bit more organic and less structured where we just had that conversation afterwards. And someone said, Hey, you know, you're talking over your guests too much. Back off a little bit. 
makes sense. Yeah, no, I think this is great. Um, so when it comes to uh, Big Leaf, we didn't really talk a whole lot about Big Leaf, but um, what is it that you guys offer when it comes to you know your your um, your your network and and how do, how you guys make the internet better um, and how can people learn more about the things that you guys are doing there? Yeah, so uh, Big Leaf Networks has been around for 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 several well, more than ten years. Uh, mm-hmm. It's an awesome company headquartered in Portland. We you know were founded. And and we remain focused on internet optimization. So so think of it as I, I have a business, a distribution endpoint, a franchise, um, you know, a tire store, a dermatology clinic, a bank, a, a, a law office, and everything that I do out of that facility is 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 based on internet based applications. And I need performance. So the internet is a utility, if you will. It, there's no real guaranteed performance, but I need. You know, I need, I need my internet to perform. I also need it to fail over to either a 5G network or to another wired network in the event of, um, of an outage. Mm-hmm. I need it to load balance across those circuits and be predictable so that when I'm on a podcast talking to, to you, John, I don't have any interruptions in service and that I maintain state. And if anything could happen, you know, at and could go down or Comcast could go down and both at and and Comcast could go down. And I'm going to continue to maintain state with you here on this call. And so our customers are, um, are folks that rely on the internet and they need high quality. They need uh, 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 you know, redundancy, high quality, and prioritization so that, again, I, I, you know, I happen to have it, the product deployed in my home. But if you think you know, here at the house, this podcast would take preference over uh, a YouTube stream and and so, you know, so in a, in a large office environment, uh, um, and that's kind of what, that's what our, you know, where you have lots of applications that are competing for, for, for connectivity, um, then, then that's really where our product shines. So we work a lot with service providers, you know, Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, those types of folks that are trying to get to market, uh, with their wholesale, uh, broadband technology. And we help make that a better experience and then give the end users the confidence to be able to number one make cloud application decisions uh, to run their business, which have great economies for them, um, but to also um, to be able to to make a decision that you know what I'm going to run my business on wholesale. You know, I mean, excuse me, on on fixed wireless broadband uh, 5G network because I know that it performs well because I can see it right here on Big Leaf on my in my Big Leaf portal how well it performs, and so that's really what we do. So we work with a lot of large distributed businesses. Um, think of, you know, Pete's chains, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, again, law offices, you know, German t- tire stores, car dealerships, large dis- you know, businesses that have a lot of locations that rely, that, that, that uh, rely on the internet to transact. And, and I'm easy to find. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm G Davis at big Um, yeah. And, and again, I'm easy to find on, on, on LinkedIn. Awesome. And I'll link up your LinkedIn and the website of big leaf uh, networks. Uh, on the website as well. They'll be in the show notes at geekleader.com so people can look through and find, find you there. And uh, Greg, really appreciate you coming on the show. I had a great conversation. I think uh, I've learned a lot of actionable things that I can take to become a better leader. Awesome. Take care. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please go to geekleader.com to learn more about what this guest is up to. Click on their links and connect with them online. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could Leave me a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Make sure you've subscribed if you haven't already. And if you feel so inclined, you can leave me a tip by going to geekleader.com slash tip.